Hi, I'm Tracy Koga with something short and fun. This is a Hugh soundbite. Well, I want to give a very warm welcome to John and Linda, our very first Hugh chat room. So it's a little bit of a different format. So John, I am going to talk to you first a little bit about our topic. And of course, it's Bill 64. And uh, with everything that's happened now, with our premier stepping down, uh, uh, like an interim premier coming forward, and you know, very bold statements on a lot of things. Um, my question to you right now, is Bill 64 really gone? Well, I, I don't think so. <laughs> first, first of all, I, I think that, that Bill 64 <clears throat> was uh, just in the background of the what we would call the best document or the Better Education Starts Today document. And it was that that was the implementation of Bill 64, and that was proceeding and may still be proceeding at a particular kind of rate in spite of the fact that Bill 64 is gone. Now, parts of Bill 64, of course, uh, and parts of BEST will be gone simply because if it's not in the legislation, then there will be no elimination of school boards uh, at the present time. There's no amalgamations, uh, those kinds of things. But as far as the other kinds of things, the consultations, uh, the committees that were set up, the various kinds of task forces and stuff, there's actually nothing preventing them from, from going ahead. Uh, so, the, so the concern still uh, exists. We had, a, we had a bill which represents the government's thinking on a particular kind of notion of schooling and, and education. But in fact, the best document uh, outlines pretty clearly how they wanted to proceed with that. And, and then uh, after Cliff Cullen announced that Bill 64 was dead and you know, his first announcement after Bill 64 was, was killed by Gertzen, um, he suggested that, well, they weren't really done with education yet. Okay, so if they're really not done with education yet, it means that they, I, I think that we can interpret that to mean that they haven't given up their agenda. And their agenda has very little to do with education. So <laughs> there's, there's a problem. If they talk about uh, doing things for children, but in fact, there's really actually nothing in either one of the documents, I think, that addresses, you know, uh, the major educational issue in regards to uh, children's education. So. That sounds really dangerous. And then what does that mean too to marginalize communities, indigenous and newcomers in this bill? Yeah, I, I think it actually is all, when you, when you talk about marginalized, I think I would include poor kids of every yeah. kind. The, the biggest issue is, the biggest, single biggest educational issue is poverty and it's family poverty and there's such a strong correlation and it, it it seems to be that the government avoids they're not the first government to do this so you know this isn't a necessarily a partisan statement but what what they're doing is avoiding talking about what the real issues are in regard to educational mm -hmm. success of children and the real issues are is that we have children who start out <laughs> Indigenous uh, children, uh, newcomer children, uh, other other children in poverty. At birth, they basically are at the same point as as children that are in middle class and doing well and so on, and and come from stable homes and and so on. Not to suggest that some of the poor homes aren't stable, <laughs> because they are, but the they start out at the same point. But by the time they uh, come to school, they've lost a lot of ground. Uh, and they've lost a lot of ground partly because they, uh, their parents are unable to provide the kind of environment that middle class and, and more wealthy uh, people can provide for their children, whether it comes to reading books, whether it comes to experiences like Manitoba Theatre for Young People, whether it comes to, uh, you know, a whole variety of things, even, even things that some of us take for granted now we take our grandkids camping 
every year, right? Well, these are things that poor kids don't experience. Um, and they often experience what I would say, uh, what we don't talk about very much is that we actually force many poor children into adult roles far before they should be in them. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for, for example, 43% of the people who use the, uh, the uh, food bank, the Manitoba Har Harvest Manitoba now, are children. You know, uh, children should not be out scrounging for food. Mm -hmm. They should not be out scrounging, bringing food home for the family. They should not be out uh, looking for clothing and whatever else for their siblings. You know, they should be children. <laughs> they should be allowed to, to you know, not worry about things like where the next next meal is coming from, or not worry about the fact that they don't have, uh, you know, decent shoes if it's raining or if it's snowing, or they don't have clothes for those kind. Of, kids should not have to worry about those kinds of things, and this is a solvable problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's and I, I think that's the biggest disappointment here is that we all actually know that this is the biggest educational problem there is. Mm -hmm. So we actually talk about kids not in terms in terms of those kids in terms of kids needing certain kinds of things so that they'll do it well at school or so that they'll actually have good life experiences and stuff like this we talk about them as test scores we talk about them as future workers we talk about them as <coughs> science technology and mathematics people you know because that's the future i mean this this is a this is a narrow future mm -hmm. for kids and and actually to predetermine kids future in those kinds of way or, or or kind of pre assign roles to children uh is really problematic and it really does avoid you know it steps around the real issue yeah well i'm going to bring linda in here into the conversation so now we've tackled or we're talking now about poverty being probably the mm -hmm. number one uh culprit uh, I want to ask a question to both of you now. Instead of an administrative and looking at like politics and power, what would we look at if we were looking at the curriculum and what needs to be changed? And what would you like to see changed? Linda, do you want to go first? I don't. I don't mind. But oh. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think in terms of the curriculum. Uh, I, th I think, first of all, I'd like to have an expanded notion of what curriculum is. <laughs> because, because curriculum, in fact, is the relationship between the teacher and the children. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the uh, discussion that teachers have with children about what it means to be a good person and what it means to be a good member of the community and stuff like this. So I think I'd, let, I'd want a recognition and acknowledgement that curriculum is more than these documents, you know, and it's more than kind of just downloading information and, and, and stuff like this. It's, it's the whole experience of children in school. Now, part of the problem in, in this document is that it, it does mention, uh, you know, first of all, in terms of newcomer education, the only thing it mentions is English language, <laughs> English as a second, as an additional language. That's a huge problem. Like, I mean, it's, it's not the only issue and for some immigrant children and newcomer children it's not the major issue by far i mean if they're if they've spent the first 12 13 5 6 whatever years in a refugee camp uh there's a lot of other stuff going on uh that needs to be attended to and that should be part of the school curriculum mm -hmm. and it it actually isn't covered under kind of mental health issues and stuff like this though though that's probably an important uh, aspect of what we need to think about. Now, the other thing is that the suggestion, at least if, the way I read it, and I, I'm quite critical, of course, the way I read it is that it it's almost suggests like Indigenous education or Indigenous knowledge is only actually uh, meant for Indigenous kids, <laughs> you know, and it really needs to be the approach really needs to be is that this is everybody's business mm -hmm. right this is we should all know 
all our children should know. We should know the history. We should know, I mean, we can't possibly capture all the cultural nuances and so on, but we should know that there are people who actually approach and see the world differently than, than the mainstream of people. And, and, and the curriculum doesn't do a really good job of that. And certainly these documents don't even acknowledge that that is true. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to stop there. And I'd like to hear from you. <laughs> I'm probably not quite as eloquent, but I can't agree with you more, John. The, the, the whole notion that, um, the, that the curriculum piece is the, um, the notion of how kids interact with one another, um, what, their back, what all of their backgrounds might be, an understanding of people. Um, you know, you talked earlier about kids coming to kindergarten from um, poverty situations, and they come with such an ex experience experiential deficit. Um, some of their parents have, uh, sometimes that's multi-generational, their parents have come from experiential deficits too. And there really needs to be a huge piece of school that um, gives kids information about each other, um, whether it's their cultures, whether it's their, their home lives, whether it's how different people operate, um, whether it's what futures there might be out there. Um, in terms of what they might dream about after school and as adults um, and, and ties that together and, and teaches kids a little bit about all the variations and then how to, uh, how to respect them in one another and how to uh, work together and enjoy one another. Um, it's a huge piece. If, uh, if you end up compartmentalizing, if you will, kids, um, the, uh, the conflict that comes of it um, is just it, it just multiplies and you you'll find that you have teachers that spend more time dealing with um, anger and, and discipline kinds of things and really if if all of those pieces are in place and you start to deal with the the humanity of the kids and, and tie what their own experiences are to the experiences of others and to the world around them um, uh, you find that you've You've eliminated all the time wasted with the with some of the um, nastiness that goes on between kids and some of the discipline issues too. Oh. Really important. So obviously, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, John. I want to add one more thing. I think if you take a critical look at what's happening here and you have some historical knowledge about what's happened in other places that have tried to do what these people are, what the government's suggesting under Bill sixty four. What you see is a, a privatization or a and a commodification of education. By privatization, I mean this, even, even, even by saying that every parent would have a say in what goes on in the curriculum and stuff like this, uh, suggests that they're actually their own, in, their only interest, quite frankly, is their own child. And this is not true at all. Like uh, the, the purpose of public schools is in fact to create a sense of the public, sense of that we're all in this together, that what uh, what actually hurts one person hurts everybody. Uh, what's good for one person might be good for everybody else. Uh, and what we're trying to do is actually with public schools is we're trying to form a sense of community, uh, of diverse community, right a, a, a community that recognizes the difference that exist differences that exist uh in between and across peoples and and as linda said really values that and and you know uh and says this is really an enriching part of part of my life right instead of as this document suggests actually because if we bill going back to bill 64 one part of bill 64 said that everybody will be held accountable for following the curriculum, except for homeschoolers and private schools. Okay. Now, if you if you read between the lines, I think the private schools couldn't escape that uh, very easily. But homeschoolers can escape this easily. They already are avoiding this, you know, to a huge extent, right? And and what they're doing is hiving themselves off from the rest of the children and the rest of the people as if 
Uh, we just assume not live with those people in some kind of relationship, right? Or we're better off not living with those people in some kind of relationship, or it's actually harmful to us to live in, a, in, in with those people in some kind of relationship to, to some things we believe. And we're actually seeing, you know, if I extrapolate a little bit, we're, we're seeing the consequences of that uh, in those places that have large numbers of homeschoolers. And by that, I mean in, in the Steinbeck community and in the Winkler community, we're seeing all the non-vaxxers who in the name of freedom are suggesting, of course, that you know their private wills and wants and whims and stuff like that actually supersede the interests of the society or the group, if you want. So. Oh, and well, thank you. And then I just want to welcome Julianne. Oh, yay! Julianne, Julianne Hi, meet, yeah, meet John and and Linda. So we're right in the thick of things. Uh, Bill sixty four definitely not gone. Um, talking about poverty being number one, that's not been addressed. And right now, uh, we're talking about curriculum and how it should change. Uh, John just commented on the homeschoolers that are getting away with it. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say getting away with it, but, <laughs> um, you know, they are, they are exempt from this bill, as are private schools, but private schools definitely have a harder time. Um, so you can jump in. It's the first day of back to school, or, and how was it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was it went well um like uh we were actually talking today about how like we don't know what we don't know mm -hmm. right so there, there's a lot of confusion um and we're just kind of learning to be okay with the confusion mm -hmm. um like we just need to be able to move forward with with the students that we have in front of us like i am a little more removed from the classroom with my role mm -hmm. um, but even in our support roles um, we are really looking at, you know, what, what's the best way that we can support our learners, because that's our number one, mm -hmm. um, but also the staff, uh, yes. because we need the staff to be well and yeah. our administrators to be well. Um, so we're kind of, uh, kind of re-gearing for, for this year. We don't know what that's going to look like for the whole year, <laughs> um, but we've been flexible since, yeah. since March of uh, 2020, and um, it just continues, just being very flexible to what, um, what people need and meeting them where they're at is really the the key focus that we have right now. Oh, I know. I mean, def definitely interesting times. So that leads me to, because you're, Judy Ann, you just mentioned staff, teachers. So the students, number one, but then maybe possibly the teachers. So where do they all sit? Like, well, we had, um, we had Nathan Martindale from Manitoba Teachers Society on, and, we def and he definitely gave a very succinct uh, view of where the teachers stand and all of the evidence to prove it. So what happens to the teachers now? Uh, you know, maybe we'll start with you, Judy Ann. I know. What right. supports? Um, yeah, so right now, um, just like between my colleagues who I, who I keep in touch with, uh, who are in classrooms, um, there's of course a lot of anxiety. Um, I think we, we all feel a little bit more a little bit better with with the news about having certain divisions having the mask mandates mm -hmm. um just feeling a little more comfortable with that but there is still a lot of anxiety for sure and it's we're all very nervous about the uncertain right things that we can't plan for um like we can be as prepared as we can be uh, but there are definitely going to be things that are thrown in that um we aren't that we aren't prepared for mm -hmm. but we're going to do our best to just pivot and and to um to be able to adjust in our practice because um, in, in a regular school year, you'd have to adjust every year to your students, but this time it's just kind of adjusting every few months, every few weeks, just depending on the situation. Um, I, yeah, there's just been a lot of anxiety for, for the staff that I've been talking to, that I've been reaching out. Mm -hmm. um, but we're kind of doing our best to talk through it and, and just reminding them that, you know, we got through it last year with all the changes. We got through it the year before that. Um, and we're just going to continue to be, to be respond, like just respond to whatever changes are coming our way. Wow. Linda, you have a daughter that's also a teacher. Uh, I do. I mean, what are, what are today's teachers? That's a loaded oh, question. Uh -huh. <laughs> what are today's teachers? Well, <laughs> they're multitaskers. Um, but I think, uh, I think again, fundamentally, they are people who are concerned about their students. Um, they are taking their students on a path. Certainly the, the 
the more traditional viewpoint of curriculum where you're looking at content and material. They are taking their, their students down a, a path of discovery to do that. But I think they they aren't successful very long if they don't um, realize that they have to know who their students are as people mm -hmm. and be there and develop relationships such that um, that kids will trust them mm -hmm. and kids will make, a, make them aware of what's going on in, in their lives and in their heads and what the stresses are that they're facing because kids are feeling really stressed about this. Mm -hmm. um, I read some of the feedback and, and uh, my daughter is teaching high school. Um, I, I read some of the feedback she got from her students at the end of June and the common theme was, thank you for being there when I was losing it. Thank you for listening to me and being someone that I knew I could go to when I was finding things overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one gave her a box of Kleenex with little notes all around it to, to thank her for all of the Kleenex that Shannon had supplied for her. <laughs> through the year. Um, oh, no. Profound oh. things about how kids were feeling. And you, you got the impression and uh, you really saw how important um, teachers are a, a, as people mm -hmm. um, and how important it is that they connect with, with students. Um, and I think, I think that was part of my concern with, with Bill 64 too, my own experience and my experience mm -hmm. watching her too, um, was that you know, kids she dealt with, certainly the students were very happy to have her there and some of the and I know she had relationships with parents as well um, to connect as human beings and connect one another as human beings mm -hmm. I, I know she and her colleagues felt good about the support she got within her school and she certainly felt within her division as well mm -hmm. I know as well she was very respectful of the fact that there were things going on in other divisions and in a in a former life John and I represented two different school divisions and sometimes we did things a little differently. Um, sometimes we, when we did, wondered what was going on, we compared notes and got ideas from one another. Mm -hmm. And yet we could go back and figure out how to implement them with the populations that we were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to, to teachers. Um, some, of my, uh, some of my work when I did my master's, um, I looked at the fact that I was using a lot of American research in terms of implementing um, practices in schools. And yet I went to a conference in the US and I ended up in a session talking to people and talking about implementation. And it ended up where the speaker stopped and asked me to speak about it because <laughs> we were doing much more in terms of the implementation mm -hmm. than they were. And my, in reflecting on it, my impression was that we were, I was at the time in a small school in a, 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 in a community that was overseen by a, a division who when I said, help, I, I, there's something special going on here that needs to be attended to. They knew enough about my situation that they were there to help me. Um, I wasn't looking at a school of uh, 5,000 kids um, in a division that was citywide that didn't have that personal piece. And the more I think about it, it's the personal, the ability to zero in on the personal pieces and, and, and again, teach the kinds of connections we talked mm -hmm. about before and get those going, as John and I did years back, on talking about what happened in opposite mm -hmm. sides of the city. Um, those are the things that drive successful education and make the other things work. Yeah. And I, I think that was the big, you've got me going about the, <laughs> the big concern I had about Bill 64 is that it seemed to be focused on moving in exactly the opposite direction. Yeah. And to me, that's a, a, a recipe for concern. No doubt. John, so you've been listening intently now. Uh, so I'm gathering from what uh, Linda has said in your past experiences, and, and Judy Ann is, was nodding her head, can we not still why? Bill 64 isn't here, and we're, we're not governed by one school of thought. Cannot the divisions now make a difference, do some changes, implement some programs, have discussions with other school divisions, 
and move things forward, you know, and, and, and address things like poverty, the mental health issues, the curriculum, the things that need to be taught and learned. Is that yeah, possible? I, yeah, if, if I might. I, first of all, I want to add something to what uh, Judy Ann and Linda said. First of all, yeah. teachers are representatives of, the, uh, representatives of the society, and they know that that's their role. They, you know, and, and teachers, my ki our kids are both teachers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, they understand clearly that what they're doing when they get in front of a classroom is that they're representing the society and the public and their province and, and whatever else, right? And, and, and so when the minister at one point suggested to teachers, well, this should be no concern of yours, right? Because you have a job to do as teachers, right? That as, as if teachers live in some kind of bubble which is removed from the real world. And I think that's simply not true. And it's, you know, uh, and, and it's really problematic. Now, let me address the, the question you asked, mm -hmm. though. I, I think that's exactly what school divisions do do. They, yes. and, and they they share notes across all the time. Uh, they did that before. When, when we did a study on poverty for the Social Planning Council and we interviewed superintendents, we they had 99 different poverty reduction strategies that they were using in their school divisions, wow. right? And those, those things go all the way from providing lunches for kids mm -hmm. to doing it very quietly so that the kid doesn't lose any dignity, you know, in the process kind of thing. To, to bigger issues like no school fees, to other issues like uh, we'll minimize fundraising. You know, you there are school divisions have what they simply need. If, if I was going to say something, what the province could do here, they would simply say, would you tell us what resources you need to mitigate the problems of poor children coming to school? Like what kind of resources do you need? Because I'll tell you what, poverty is not a local issue, maybe on one hand. On the other hand, the only responses that seem to work are local responses. You know, the responses that actually take place where children are, right? And as Linda and Judy Ann said, if you know the children, you know what what that something's going on here, right? And you know, our teachers are pretty astute about this. They know that something's going on. Uh, if a, ch a child is angry or they're not participating or a variety of other kinds of behaviors, which actually don't go along with children in general, but maybe particularly a child in a particular situation, they keep an eye out for it. There, there are frontline people when it comes to child exploitation. There are mm -hmm. frontline people when it comes to Virtually everything has to do with children outside the home, you know. They, those, and they keep an eye on 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 that stuff. So, I would I would simply say, is that people really misjudged the, the the government really misjudged teachers when they thought they would get into some kind of competition, you know, and and put out all these amazing ideas and the government would fund them and they look like you know, a uh, sugar daddy kind of giving giving money out to these deserving teachers who put in projects and stuff like this. Well, the fact is that teachers have been doing that forever, as Linda suggested. When something needs to be looked after, they either go to their principal or they go to their colleagues and say, well, what do you guys think about this? Like, uh, here's something I think would be a good answer to this. And and so often, that's why there are 99 different answers to some of this stuff. <laughs> and there's probably as many as there are children, on the other hand. But, uh, you know, uh, the fact is that teachers actually do uh, bring these things to the table. And they do get responded to most of the time if there are resources to respond to them. Mm -hmm. But that is a major issue and that of course is one of the major issues with this government because what they're doing is starving education yeah wow so we are kind of running short of time so i'm just going to ask all of you round table um what can we do 
I mean, and, and as citizens, and what should we be aware of? You know, even though I, my kids are older, they're not in, in school anymore, and, and why should I care? And we had that conversation because it does affect us. It, it certainly does. Our, these are our future, our future leaders that are going to run the country, so to speak. So, Judy Ann. Yeah, I think um, this past, with, with the announcement of that, like Bill 64, at least for the time being, uh, in what it was, is like a scrapped. Um, I think that was just a solid example of what happens when we take action. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Like we've we've really advocated for it. Like um, part of the Bill 64 that really bothered me too was a, the idea of um, like having certain topics that are too sensitive. Yeah. Uh, but the reality of it is when those the bodies were found in Kamloops, students came to me crying and asking what that's about and why. Mm -hmm. And how do you not answer that question? And do you want them to just go on Facebook and find the answer? Of yeah. course, you need to address it. They're upset. They're distressed. You're not going to let a student suffer um, mm -hmm. and, and just agonize over this thing when you can easily address it. Right. So with um, with Bill 64 being scrapped, um, now we're showing students that we when you do take action, like there are like positive consequences to that um, when you band together as a community. So I think it just continuing to be um, aware of what is the what the changes are mm -hmm. um being informed about it and then making your decision and, and you know taking that action because we saw it with this there's a lot of other fields that could also use that type of action you know you're thinking i'm right now i'm thinking about the nurses mm -hmm. um and and them not having a contract breaks my heart my mother's a nurse um so yeah so just as a community what can we do to band together this is a time that our, our students are actually seeing results mm -hmm. from taking action so that that's my advice is just to continue doing what you can um, to advocate for what's right. Oh, thanks, Judy Ann. Linda? Um, yeah, I, I think it's really important that the conversation continue at this point. Um, I think uh, we do have to keep asking questions. Um, uh, parents need to keep asking questions. But I think one of the things that got left out a little bit in the, in the Bill 64 conversation was that parents have, have hired, if you will, a strong contingent of resources. They are teachers and administrators and support workers. Well, we're all teachers. And they have, uh, they have spent years working on uh, a huge bank of knowledge that should be brought to the fore. I think it's important to get conversations going, but include those experts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really do fear, as, as Joan says, that education has been um, starved. I, I'm, I'm realistic enough to know that there are not unlimited dollars. Um, but maybe it is time to get people together to say, okay, how can we use our dollars better or differently? What can, can you see any place where we could save some dollars and then put them here? Um, but do it in an honest fashion. Don't say we're going to save $40 million getting rid of trustees, because I taught math for 36 years in one way, shape, or form, <laughs> and I couldn't make those numbers work. No. <laughs> um, and I, I think, uh, and I was around long enough to, to really feel pretty strongly that this was the second crack at just taking a, a financial hit at education by a conservative government. And that disturbed me a fair bit. And that's another, that could be another whole program. Oh, maybe, um, maybe. But, um, but I think the conversation does have to go on. Uh, mm -hmm. The government does have to come to some agreement about what are the needs and then how are those funded. How can their, it's their responsibility to fund them as, as judiciously as they can, but not just arbitrarily say, okay, you're going to get along with better because we're going to, quit paying you as uh, quit your pay increases. We're going to give you another herd of kids. And, and there are many parallels to the nursing situation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we need to, to speak up and advocate for the humanity part of what frontline workers do, be mm -hmm. they teachers, be they nurses, be they a, a whole host of other things and make sure that um, we're not trying to balance a budget by pulling a rug out from any of them. And I think right. there can be honest conversations. Yeah. And I know that um, 
uh, school divisions get together and compare notes. There yeah. may be there may be some economies of scale that could be found if you mm -hmm. put the heads that are working with those things together. Yeah. And uh, got some conversations going. John. But. Yeah, I would just say, make sure that you support teachers and support their right to have a voice and, and speak out on things, uh, you know, that they have a right to bargain in, in a fair kind of way. We'd want this for everybody, but, uh, but you know, these people have made a huge investment uh, in, in uh, their work. They are hugely invested <laughs> in their work. It, uh, you know, Judy Ann will tell you that she lies awake at night. She'll lie awake tonight wondering how she could get to that one kid who she didn't get to yesterday. And, you know, and, and stuff like this. Uh, people are usually... Uh, I, I think that part of it is try to imagine what what the people in the system are feeling mm -hmm. at certain times. You know, like I'm, I'm speaking to a CUPE group in a couple of days. Uh, and and QP was also worried about Bill 64 because secretaries, trustees, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, bus drivers, you know, uh, EAs, others were under attack. I mean, they're, they're simply being attacked the same way as everybody else. And it's part of this kind of destruction of the public agenda, if you want. Wow. Well. Well, you know what, I want to thank all of you for again joining. And you know what, obviously this is not the end of the conversation. You know, I, I see that we can come back here a month from now and, and hopefully things have changed for the better or not. But you're right, you know, we give this platform for people to speak. And thank you so much, Linda, judy -Ann, John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Good meeting you two again. Good, Linda. Yeah. And yes, Julianne, thank you, John. all the best thank tomorrow. You, John, for all the advocacy you. you've been doing. That's been great and very much appreciated.